Perfect. All right, so thanks for uh, being here for this uh, last session before uh, the closing remarks, the poster session and the gala dinner. So we thought about putting this uh, panel discussion because this systems immunology uh, session was the first one in this uh, type of uh, meeting. And uh, within the air community, we really strongly want to push toward uh, integrating our air data in the systems immunology world, meaning others omics data and see and improve our knowledge uh, of immune responses uh, and disease and so on and so forth. So we are here to have this panel discussion and I would like to start maybe with a, a provocative question after actual presentation. Um, are we ready to create a company <laughs> <laughs> based on our data? Um, and in other words, uh, so, so to, to reach this goal, uh, is there any challenges that we are facing? And, and if so, which one, computer-wise, data-wise, uh, technology-wise? So any thoughts? Don't be shy. Uh, okay, so I don't know. I don't know about the, uh, the 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 company. I mean, I guess I'll say one. Well, I guess I said two things. So one is I see the um, field moving a lot towards single cell. I mean, I think we've we've spent a lot of years in the air community um, dealing with these bulk uh, bulk repertoire data sets. A lot of the data in in our data repositories ends up being you know is, is a lot of these sort of bulk sequencing data sets, you know, heavy, uh, heavy chain based. Um, and as the field moves towards um, single cell, I guess one thing that's be becoming apparent, at least to me, is that a lot of the, a lot of the repertoire properties that you're going to calculate, um, clonality, somatic hypermutation frequency, um, the CDR3 lines, like all of these sort of tip things that we, we sort of depend on as our signatures for machine learning or, or, or whatever it is. They really differ quite a bit when you split it out by the B cell subset that you're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. So if you split by the, the, the naive cells of the plasma, you know, the plasma or the memory or, or, or whatnot. And, and we know that the frequencies of those cells can vary quite a lot across, across different people, either, either you know, based, you know, healthy, you know, without any particular immune exposure or perturbation, um, uh, and, and, and especially afterwards. And so to me, I guess it becomes a little bit of a challenge now how we deal or sort of think about these databases full of, the, of, of, of bulk receptors, um, to what extent are the properties we're looking at um, sort of just reflecting changes in the frequencies of these different cell types. And it's sort of like a really expensive way to do you know, some flow cytometry um, or, or, or how, do we, how do we sort of get past that? Um, or is everything just gonna move to the or a single cell realm um, where we can have that information. I don't have a company. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have any companies up there. Are we on? I mean, of course, we, we I mean, the, the Air Data Commons is moving to the single cell, which in some naive way means we are doing systems immunology. We're bringing in other types of data. So that's, but um, I, I, we're always kind of looking for these diagnostic signals and maybe there haven't been a lot of them. And I think a tool had a bunch of, well, I found this connection and I started a company. I found that connection and I started a company. Well, I think to some degree, we're still looking for some of those connections so. with disease and yeah. So, oops. <laughs> okay, so from, um from a perspective, basically, what is the basis that we need before we can move to the company stage, which would require that we have some stables that are signal, uh, the, some signals that are stable. Um, I think the two challenges when we're getting into those multi omics or however we want to call it are right now. So at least twofold. The one thing is clearly data quality. Um, because um, this is, and this is something 
the air community has tried to address in our on our own turf. We have tried to provide rich data annotations in the my air data standard. So this by itself doesn't secure quality, but it allow at least allows people to make sound judgment on whether they trust data. And then of course, all the endeavors of the um, biological resources um, working group to um, provide um, additional standards um, so that it becomes easier to interpret the um, information that we get. But um, once we start connecting to other technology platforms, um, we might have to think whether those standards are enough. Because I, I mean, sometimes sometimes there seems to be this impression that um, noise will cancel each uh, will will cancel uh, each other out in different me methodologies. But um, often it doesn't, and it's just that. Um, garbage time garbage is just garbage square and uh, not some kind of nice flat line. So this is this is clearly challenge number one. Challenge number two is um, from the data structure point of view um, uh, that we very clearly need to make sure that the infrastructures that we're building are stable and that um, data sets don't start dropping out. So we need to think about sustainability of the infrastructure and um, need to make sure that references between data sets stay that way, at least to a minimal extent, um, like um, tombstone records. So if a repository dies, then it must be clear, okay, so there once was a data set here, unfortunately it's gone, but at least that these things don't go um, out into the void. Um, which means very clearly that um, the artifacts, data artifacts that we are generating across the board um, need to have some kind of persistent identifier structure. Um, because otherwise, um, it will be very, very difficult to replicate these um, things five years from now, or five, five years from the point that they were created. And um, this is um, something that will very hardly affect the reproducibility of what people are trying to do, and with this, of course, also the credibility of the field. Yeah, so those are my two cents. <laughs> so, 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 okay, so um, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll say something to start a conversation that I haven't fully thought through. Um, given, I mean, given the, um, just in response to this, given how variable all the different library prep methods um, <laughs> and everything else has been up to this up to this point, and you know, now you know perhaps there's a few companies and starting to standardize. Why why bother trying to keep everything from the past uh, in this in this state? I mean, maybe it makes more sense to you know not quite start a clean slate. But sort of, you know, re, you know, keep the things from the, you know, sort of establishing um, you know, commercial kit methods, um, things like 10x, where there are sort of masses of data which maybe are going to be more comparable and reproducible, and and not worry about the rest. The question is whether we will see that level of dominance. I mean, in the sequencing field, um, at some point. 2006, 2007, a couple of designs started. The, the design that prevailed was Illumina. Um, so therefore, it's relatively easy, the types of parameters of workflows that you need to standardize for that one. If this will happen on the single cell level at some point, I don't know. Um, if I would know, I would buy stock options for that company. <laughs> um, I think there are quite a good amount of promising technologies. And yes, this will allow um, to make things simpler. And I think for companies like 10X, we have, we've, we've seen quite good progress um, with, their, um, um, with their protocols. And then we don't need to support um, necessarily all the things from the past. This is, but I mean, right now, yes, of course, we, we do have some kind of legacy support. But um, the main thing that will be important um, uh, is that people can, when they're starting new into the field, that 
that they nevertheless can try to replicate stuff. So I think this is the, this is not it's not contradicting each other. Um, I wouldn't go to great lengths to say, oh, there was this one protocol in that JI paper in 2010, and we really should support this. No, <laughs> I think it's it's it. I mean, we need to we need to focus our resources, and clearly the larger platforms are important here. So what would we need to take advantage of all those data? Because I agree that we should move on and probably move on to methods that are going to be more standardized because the world is now present for everyone. But still, we have this massive data. So we have our data common with many information. That might not be the most perfect one for all the data set, but still there's biological information, signal over there. So how as a community, we could decide what has been done already, all these standards, information to know how they were prepared, generated uh, the pros and cons. So how we could qualify, can we qualify or, or, or just provide additional information to, so, to make those data um, usable. Um, I think, so we talked a lot about, so I think the care community comes a lot from this diagnostics point of view. Many people mm -hmm. are working on diagnostics, but I think, and there, every, as we have also said, we, it's still hard to find a signal in the data, probably because we also always look in the blood and where you should look is on either population level or mm organ level where the disease is actually happening. But I think for the um, for antibody or TCR development, for example, there a lot of the data sets are being used. And there, I think maybe batch effects are maybe not so important because a lot of people mm -hmm. are using those language models across data sets, mm -hmm. just dump everything into the machine learning model. And then um, it seems to be working somehow because mm -hmm. those companies can optimize their antibodies. So, I think it really depends on the use case of sometimes mm. it doesn't matter, but for diagnostics where I think the signal is very subtle, there I think it matters a lot, whereas maybe for antibody development, when you average across a lot of things, maybe it doesn't matter so much. So, I, But I think that requires also more research on when it matters and when it does matter, this variability across data um, generation. And I think, I guess this is not necessarily supposed to be just us, but yes. if, there's, uh, if there's comments, uh, then anyone Especially can make companies. Free to uh, <laughs> jump in. No comments? I guess with, with answer to Steve's to some degree, he was saying, I think you were saying, well, there might be some older data sets that were taken under primitive or older conditions and should we be worrying about them? But I mean, I think, I mean, for a couple things, you know, you talk about, well, the early 10X genomics data sets <laughs> are as good as the more recent ones, you know, or something. I mean, to some degree, I think we're driven by what people want and we don't want to, Right. Not have the Emerson data set in there, and then now ten people are going to have to re-download the Emerson data set and re-annotate it. So to some degree, it's what people want, I think. But that's kind of obvious. But, yeah. So, yeah. Well, may I ask a yeah. question about that? So um, regarding how much we want to keep around the old data versus just migrating to data on these newer, more reliable platforms. I mean, is this suggestion, or I'm wondering what people's thoughts are that there's really not useful information remaining right. in this data? Because I wouldn't go that far, right? Well, and so if we right. think there's still useful information there, I think there's still a case to be made for maintaining it. Um, and even with these newer, more high throughput and improved technologies, is still going to be some years before we've been able to apply them at sufficient scale across a large enough number of individuals and disease types, et cetera. I think to really believe that we've recaptured any of the information that may be in all these existing data sets, even though it's maybe less robust.
so so I guess from what from what I see, um, there's been a you know a good you know community of you know a lot of people here who've been sort of in repertoire for for a while, but what I've seen over the last Again, just sort of my perspective on it, you know, what I've seen over the last few years is with the advent of things like 10X and the ability to fairly reasonably sort of add on BCR and TCR into your single cell experiment and just how many labs are sort of adopting those single cell uh, approaches. The, that is where, um, I don't have numbers on this, but, but you know, just my, my sort of anecdotal evidence, that is where I see sort of the mass of labs getting involved in repertoire um, and huge numbers of, of labs that were never in the field before sort of getting into it from the single cell side, sort of adding, you know, sort of adding this on uh, to their experiments. And the sort of major um, bioinformatics platforms uh, in, the, in, the, in the area, the the the, the, Zerat, the Scampis, the whole, you know, that, those whole communities are also starting to move into repertoire through that, uh, you know, through those avenues. Um, and so I think unless we engage those communities and sort of start thinking about, uh, you know, I guess what was brought up in the, why the sort of panel was good, sort of starting to think about how repertoire is not just existing on its own, mm -hmm. but it's gonna be connected to, um, you know, transcriptome and ATAC and, you know, all these other uh, omics. Uh, you know, all the data standards, all the databases, all everything is essentially going to come, you know, come, come from that end and through those, you know, from adding it on to those established platforms. Uh, and that's, I think that's what's going to happen. Well, so, yeah, so, 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 so I guess, I guess what I would say from that is that our energy should be spent looking forward and sort of um, 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 preparing for that future, you know, and sort of major effort there as opposed to, uh, and I know you can do, you know, you can kind of do both, but, uh, but I do, I would want to make sure that we, you know, sort of engage and, and be prepared because those data sets are coming now uh, and the worry is that we're not, we're not sort of capturing all those, my worry. I think I think then my question would be I mean I'm I'm completely sold on this idea to say um, the big advantage of single cell platforms is now we have that one atomic unit in biology that that everyone can integrate on and where we can also then integrate with other communities and with this one we are to a certain extent also are capable of normalizing against all those additional effects that we've seen in, in, in platforms that we used five years ago. Question is, when do you, when, when do we consider it to be mature enough to, to really invest in it? Because this is, this, this is, this is something that will be um, a moving target for, um, for a couple of years. And so, therefore, I don't. I don't have any good answer for it. I have to admit, but I think it's um, it's important not to not, not necessary to wait for the next better um, version of it, but simply see. Okay, so what is the what is the minimal capability that we would like to have? And I mean, we already have single cell transcriptomes, which yeah. is incredibly powerful. Um, and um, with this one, and now we have new technologies that will provide affinity information mm -hmm. with, um, with a tagging system that is pretty much limitless in contrast to what we had with other flow or mass cytometry based methodologies. So, um, well, give it another couple of months slash years, but otherwise I think this is, this is really now the, the platform that we can say, okay, the community buys into this. Um, does, so independent of the provider, but at least on a, on a capability level, um, that this is what our standards need to support. And by the way, they do support the starting um, Air Standards 1.4 release. Yeah, you, I mean, you, we, you have invested a lot of work into the single cell and the gene expression. and. And I'm also thinking all the work with the germline. I mean, that's part of systems biology. It's going down a level of data, but um, you know, all the work that Ogre DB and VDJ base and working with 
At some point, I'll talk a little bit about IUIS. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're I mean, talking about resources and investing, and we and you started about a company, but I mean, it's a little bit, I mean, a little bit uh, as a, of a joke, but it's also we need uh, we need some sort of uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, resource stream to keep this to keep it to massive keep it effort going. The, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I think that's one. I mean, to point out, I think it's been one of the huge successes of of, of the air community. The um, you know, the, the ability to sort of get those germ lines and sort of get them uh, faster into IMGT, um, which has been a huge, you know, I think, a huge benefit. Um, and I don't know if we made a big enough deal of it, but right, the standards that were uh, sort of developed, the fact that you have companies and tools like, you know, you know, Penix and Cell Ranger that will output, you know, air format files. Uh, so many software tools we saw. I mean, I think that's a huge, huge win. So, but if we, if we spin it a little bit further then, okay, so now we're integrating with other communities who are doing basic biology. Maybe if we're thinking about, so is this already the systems that we want, or how do we connect this then with a more clinical view? Um, I mean, that's that's an open question from my side because I, this is this is also the area that I'm working in. But how do we how do we connect um, this with really clinical data? Because um, single cell technologies are not in the clinic at this point. I mean, even most sequencing based stuff. Um, outside of MRD um, is um, uh, would be in regular clinical use. So, where's what? What, what is the gap on the application side um, that we can really um, come up with reasonable use cases, uh, or also use cases that are um, that have impact so on society, on our healthcare system, and so on. Does that mean thinking about including clinical data in 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 our repository in our data air um, data commons um, keeping <laughs> keeping the the privacy of the patient of course but I, I mean this is this is this is the big challenge but again mm -hmm. I mean what we are seeing in the EU um, which which people in North America might not be aware of this. I mean, there is a big push towards what the EU Commission calls data spaces, which okay. are those kind of semi-protected but relatively large um, um, pieces of infrastructure. And um, the health data space for which there is now, should, we'll, we'll see upcoming legislation that really allows healthcare providers to put data in there um, that falls under classical GDPR protection under certain rules of anonymization and then to be openly used by research, um, which is which is extremely powerful. And um, I think we need to, we need to see what is the what what are the things that we as a community need to tackle so that we did our homework to integrate with the other infrastructures. Um, I don't think that we should have too much information, too much clinical information um, in the ADC or whatever um, it is, but we need to um, we need to think about how infrastructure wise we can connect with these other um, uh, with these other things, which is what I said before, whether uh, whether persistent identifier where the pits come in because this, those th those links must be um, more um, uh, must be stronger once um, once we do cross repository linkage um, because we don't have we cannot rename things anymore later on yeah, I mean I, I think uh, you know their data commons to me is about um, it's value added data right the raw data is in the SRA or ENA um, and it's value added data and right now it's bulk air seek value added data and we're moving towards single cell but for me, it's the value add that's important. Every time somebody downloads something from their data commons, we just save somebody having to download data from SRA and run it through an IG Blast pipeline, <laughs> right? That's mm -hmm. hours of work. And so I, I would think of that from the, the same way from the single cell perspective, right? What we're doing with the single cell additions to the standards, and hopefully we'll have lots of single cell data in the area commons soon, 
that we've got something that makes it easy for a researcher to access some of this data and do something with it scientifically quickly and efficiently, right? And so that's, that to me is the value of the Air Data Commons. And if, if we move towards single cell and bulk goes off the, the back end, and if some of that stuff disappears from the Air Data Commons, I don't think that's the end of the world because scientifically from a reproducibility perspective, it's still an SRA and you can still reproduce it if you really need to. Um, so it, I think the question is, what's the best value add that the Air Data Commons and the Air Community needs to do, I think, their science? That's kind of the odd thing. I certainly would second what Brian's saying, but I'm also thinking about, I guess, on the first day, and I kind of chided us a little bit. We're worried about getting our Air Data Commons standards accepted and stuff like that, and we still need to look to our own selves in the community, and how often do we... Uh, not put out the effort to get the, the our data into the air data commons and then also you know it's always i'm always thinking you know how can we get some traction with clinical trials and um you know i'm gonna we've got 100 active people in the air community i'm gonna guess people know about clinical trials for flu or vaccines or therapies that are including these data and maybe there would be some partners there that we could you know again they're not going to put the data out into the public tomorrow but they might start loading their data in the air format and then when they do want to make it public it's going to be easy to expose it into the air data commons and I know um, Jamie's doing a lot of push with societies so there is focus the Federation of oh, Clinical okay. Immunological Societies and David Klatsman is big in focus. So, you know, we just got to keep hitting it. And uh, then I'll mention <laughs> the big data initiative in, in IUIS that Christian and I and Jamie are involved in. And it, it's, it's trying to work at this international level and make more visible that just like the air community came together to get, adopt common metadata standards for these type of data take it up a level and, and try to bring in the RNA seek people and you know they I guess have common standards for their primary data but you know can we start working with them to get some metadata standard sharing and I guess we also are going to look at flow and so you know those are the types of things we can help as a community to push and so I think that's the very good conclusion for this <laughs> panel discussion but because it's already time so yes your community should uh, probably uh, should go for these uh, societies um, work together to include other data and 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 go beyond what we started uh, still trying to keep what has been done yeah but so, I mean I think overall uh, it, it's an incredibly exciting time I mean yeah. compared to you know when we started seven ish years ago I mean the number of, of labs doing these kinds of uh, repertoire studies is, is increased uh, quite a bit. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great area. It's a great time to be doing. It. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. And let's move to the closing remarks. Oh, yeah, we have the poster.